Harry, please, uh, you can start now. Thank you very much to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. So, and uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this to this talk on um, complex networks. And today, I will not talk about uh, partitioning networks and things like that. Today, I want to focus on something which is a little bit more fancy, um, which is temporal networks. That is something which has came up in the last years in network science. So there's classical network science, and now there's temporal network science. Um, and this has an enormous potential. It, it is mathemat mathematically a little bit more challenging, and that's why there are not so many tools for it around. And I hope I can give you a first insight into what's happening in temporal networks at the moment. Um, before I start talking about networks, let's briefly summarize um, to, I will just briefly summarize where I work now. So I work at the FLI and also University of Greifswald. I just uh, talked about FLI today, so that was also the place where Alfredo was uh, in winter, in the darkest time of the year. Now it's getting better and better. So um, this here is the island of Reims, that's a very small, tiny little island that's located in the very northeastern end of Germany. It's really the end, so there's nothing around. It's like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the Texas of Germany, um, but actually quite a nice location. Uh, on this island, there's this building here that's the Institute of Epidemiology, where I also work. Um, and in this building, um, people that this is actually an interface between veterinary science, um, biology, physics, that's my background, statistics, and so on. So this is where, where this interaction is kind of happening. Uh, if, you, if you wonder why they gave us this island to work on, the reason is simply that the rest of the facilities here have high biosafety status, and they belong to the um, biosafety labs. Um, the institute itself is the German Federal Research Institute on Animal Health. Um, it has about 1,000 employees. The whole institute, the FNI, is subdivided into 11 units. They are also called institutes, to so make it a little bit more confusion. Um, and most of them actually are focusing more on, on, on virus diagnostics and things like that. Uh, that's why we have also 70 national reference labs, so quite a number. And they have biosafety level up S4, that's the highest that you get, even for large animals. That's why they have these new fancy facilities here. So, and among these 11 institutes, one of them is the one where I work in, that's the Institute of Epidemiology. And that is basically responsible for risk assessment, for annual um, reports on animal health, like livestock animal health, and so combination of statistical methods for sampling, for the diagnostics and so, and finally databases. So they, we're hosting databases here, or we at least managing databases related to um, livestock disease. So like disease notification, uh, disease notification systems, but also focus of today, um, trade networks, right? Trade of, of livestock. So with your background, so let's start talking about networks. Um, I would like to, so th this talk today will be a more method focused, so I will, I will actually talk about methods I just, I would like to have that you understand what this whole thing here is about. I will nevertheless have one data set to work on that we have something to play around with a bit, and this is a data set of pig trade from farm to farm. So that means that you have uh, premises or farms, and there's one here, there's one there, and whenever there's, uh, this one is selling pigs to the other one, there we draw a link between them, right? A directed link. Um, this is then a classical network. Um, if you do something like that for Germany, you, you would end up with something like this. So here you see uh, uh, a picture of the, of the farms involved in the network, or at least some of them, and the trade links between them. So the whole network has about 100,000 premises involved, so quite a big system. We have about three and a half million trade transactions per year, and if we aggregate that over time first, then we end up with about 300,000 um, contacts between them, like these static edges. So this is actually quite a useful tool. This is called a complex network, right? And uh, what you normally do with complex networks is you can analyze these things, and they're quite mighty tools. I'll go back to it in a few minutes. Uh, the point is, if you look at this picture here, it actually is a little bit misleading. Because if you, if you look at this complex network, you have the impression that this is a system of pipelines, let's say, right? That you have here the farm, there's another one, and there's a pipeline between them, because there's a link, right? So, and, and, and through that pipeline, I don't know, little pieces of pork or, or, or pigs or so are going through every second. Of course, that's, that's, that, that doesn't, that's actually not true, right? That's not realistic. But that's what, uh, what, what this network view here gives you. In reality, what happens is if you are a farmer and you own such premises, you would buy, uh, let's say, 100 pigs today, 
that you would keep them for half a year or so and fed them and then sell them somewhere else. And in the meanwhile, probably you do nothing, right? So that means that actually most of the times, these links here are not active at all. And that's why the real picture of the network looks more like this, right? You hear you have a highly fluctuating system over time. So this is a daily resolution here. So every day in your data set, you have a total different network, which is actually not a network at all. And uh, this is the, the, the thing, the, the object actually that we're really facing here, right? So there's a temporal network. So again, uh, the classic way to, to manage these data sets is take the data, aggregate over time, and you end up with a static network, right? Static networks, um, when, you, when you're analyzing static networks, you end up in classical network technology. It's actually quite a fancy name because it's actually also pretty new. Uh, it's, it's emerged in the beginning of the 20s or so which has two main questions, I would say, two fundamental questions, very simple. Where can a disease spread in the network? So um, having the information that the disease starts at one node in the network, following trade links and so, where can it go? Where can it end? Very simple question, but of course, in this case here, you have the data, that's why you can answer that question in detail. Uh, Hardy, Hardy, yes? one second. Can you talk a little slower because I'm understanding, but I don't know if everybody is getting the things you are saying, very, very important things I think for people to understand the whole thing. Sorry, yes. sorry about, about that, but well, can that, you, was, thank you. What was <laughs> thank you. Uh, overwhelming me. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the, the second uh, central question in classical network epidemiology is, what is a good strategy for targeted vaccination, right? So that is a, a standard question. Um, so where would you place sentinel nodes? Where would you vaccinate your network strategically so that you have least uh, costs and, and most that you get most out of it, right? So this is in, in classical network epidemiology. Um, you can answer these questions simply actually in classical um, and in static networks because there's so many tools. Uh, what is required to use that is a definition, a mathematical little definition for networks, right? So in, in, if you would be a mathematician, you would say an, a, a, a network is a graph. In, in mathematics, that's called a graph. And a graph is an in, 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 in ordered pair, G, comprising of a set of nodes, that's called V, and a set of edges, that's called E, right? And each edge is just simply a two element subset of E. That means actually an edge is a total of nodes. It's a pair of nodes, right? There are many of these things. So when you go back to what we saw about temporal networks, in temporal networks, you cannot say an edge is a total of nodes that connects to nodes because what's missing is the time information. In temporal networks, the, these edges are actually absent most of the times. They are never on, actually, except for a few days in the year. And that's why, very crucial statement, a temporal network is actually not a graph, right? It's not a mathematical graph object. And that means you cannot treat it as a mathematical graph. That means you cannot use these mathematical methods to analyze it straight away. So that is a, a quite a challenge, actually. Um, so in temporal network epidemiology, you have also main questions, of course. Um, the first ones remain the same as before. So the first one was, where can a disease spread in the network? Right? It starts somewhere, where can it go? And the second is, what is a good strategy for vaccination? Sure, the same question. On top of that, we can ask more questions here. The next one is saying, uh, disease starts here in the network and spreads there in the network following some edges. We now have a new dimension, we have a new we have a dimension of time. So we can ask the question, how much time does it take to go from here to there? Not just how many steps or so, but how much time, how, much, how many hours, how many days, how many years does it take? Very important question. Um, the second one is, um, or the fourth one here actually, the fourth, the fourth one is, given such a complicated system, a temporal network, can I pretend it's actually not a temporal network, right? Can I say, well, maybe it's, yeah, it looks fancy, interesting, but it's complicated. Maybe I, I uh, simplify it a bit and treat it as a static network and then I can use my methods which are already established. And I will, I will try to give you answers to the last two questions here throughout this talk. Um, if you, let's start with, start with static networks that we, that we find a common language here to talk about, a common language how, you, how we treat these static networks. So, um, uh, coming from static network science, you have first this graph object right here on the side. You see, uh, can you see my mouse actually? Can you see that? Yes, Hardy, we, we can. 
So here, here you see that um, here, here you see the network, right? In this case, a simple example graph which has four nodes, and we have a couple of links between these nodes. Mathematically speaking, you can represent these networks by a so-called adjacency matrix, right? That's a um, quite simple matrix. Let's call it A. It contains only zeros and ones. And it has a one whenever you have a link in the network. For example, you have a link here going from one to two. That's this link here. And that is why you have in, in row two, uh, row one, column two, you have one here, right? So this one corresponds to that link. And this goes for all links that you see there in the, in the picture. Uh, so you can store that in that matrix. Um, that's quite simple, of course. The interesting thing here is that the matrix here first is, contains everything you want to know about the network. Right, so it actually contains already the big picture of the network. Everything you want to know is somehow stored in that matrix. Second, a matrix is a well-known um, mathematical object, right? So you know everything about it, basically. It's a very fundamental mathematical object, and that is why you have so many methods for network analysis, because you can use the mighty tool of linear algebra, for example. So that goes for static networks. Um, in temporal networks, the situation is a little bit different. In, in temporal networks, one way to represent them, so it's not the only way, it's one way to do that, is to use a sequence of adjacency matrices. That means if we have different steps in time, at every time step, you have a different adjacency matrix for the network, right? A1, A2, at different days, different matrices. Let's say they have the same dimension, so the same number of nodes, but the position of the ones there, that means the, the edges, is basically looks very fluctuating, right? really complicated. In principle, this sequence can be endless, depending on how much data you have, right? So it's, it's like a, a very long flux of these, of these matrices here. So that is a mathematical object you're facing here. Uh, here's also important to note that a single, each single matrix here is actually not a network, because when you traverse a network, so when you, when you want to walk over a network, you need time for it, right? If you would treat such one, one of these snapshots here as a, as a real network, it would mean that you would be able to, to walk along that whole snapshot within one single day. That means basically if you're in Germany, you, you would start an infection somewhere and you would, you would infect many others in one single day, which of course doesn't make sense. And that's, that is why in, in, in detail you have to traverse the system really over time. So you have to, to walk across the network and at the same time you have to walk over time, right? That's how it works. Um, so that's how, how that goes mathematically. Let me, let me just briefly tell you what is the, 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 the problem here. So why, what, what is the difference, between the most fundamental difference here between static and this temporal network? If you are on a temporal network, you have to make sure that if you traverse the network, the, the, the edges you take for that traversal have to be causal. So they have to follow a causal correct order of, of edges, right? So as an example, let's look at this small network here, and let's say the bottom node here, this one here, is infected with something. It's a farm which is infected. This infected farm sells animals to the center one here on Tuesday, let's say, right? And then on Wednesday, the center one here sells animals to the upper right one. And if you would follow the sequence here, this would be a causal path for an infection process, right? So if starting here, you could somehow end up here a few days later, right? So that, that is okay. This is different if you, look the, uh, if you look at the connection from the bottom node here to the left one. Say you arrive at the center here on Tuesday, that this dashed edge here is actually, it's simply in the past, right? That's, that's why there's no way then for the infection going from here to there. And that's the main difference. If you would aggregate the network over time and you would treat it as static, you would have this path, this connection, but this connection does not exist in the real system, right? Because it's not a causal path. <coughs> this is the, um, striking difference between the two approaches. And that is why it's so complicated to, um, to, to mimic tempo networks using static ones. So coming from network science and having, let's, let's say we have a little understanding about normal classic networks, so let's, we have to start somewhere, right? So what is, the, what is a good starting point? Uh, other, other question is, what is the common ground between static and tempo networks? Okay, they both have both nodes and edges, that's fine, but that's a little bit trivial. So um, let's, let's go to the next very fundamental structure in these networks. And the next fundamental one is called the path structure of these networks. I'll just give you an uh, idea what I mean with this, and then you would see that this would, should apply to both the static and to temporal networks. 
So um, let's say you have a static network, it looks like this, some example network. Then the path structure of the network is the information, if I can go from one node to another node, nodes directly or indirectly, right? And this is stored in something which is called accessibility graph of the network. So again, if you, let's say you ask yourself the question, starting at this node here, can I reach this other node here, yes or no? Right? Of course you can, you can follow these edges, and since there is a connection going from here to there, there's an edge here in the accessibility graph. Right? So this single object here on the right contains the information, can I go from A to B, yes or no? So this concept, it's actually well known in static, in static networks, should also somehow hold for temporal networks, that you ask yourself the question starting here in the network, is there a causal connection from here to there in the network? Right, so we will, we will exploit that um, accessibility property here later on. So before we, we do that for temporal networks, um, let's talk about accessibility graphs and static networks that you have um, a feeling on understanding what you can do with these objects. Um, first, the question is how can you compute an accessibility graph? So it turns out that, you, that uh, the adjacency matrix that you have for a network can be very helpful for that purpose. Uh, here again on the lower left, you see our example, little static network. And this network has an adjacency matrix A, right? So the one with the, with the zeros and the ones. And um, so you can say, well, A means that, um, that A contains paths of length one between node pairs, right? Very trivial uh, to say that. What you can now do is, this is a nice trick, you can square the matrix A, A squared. And then you have a new matrix, um, and then you can draw the graph you get from A squared. And when you do that, you end up with this picture here. It's interesting. Question is what, what you see on this, uh, on this picture. So here, if you look closely, you see the link here. This one, for example, whenever you have a two-step connection in the original graph. Right? So that means that A squared contains path of length 2 between nodes. So that's something like a two-step graph of the original one. Right? So that's a very nice trick. And uh, you, can, you can use that for even higher orders of, of this A, or, um, A squared. So starting from your initial network with some adjacency matrix, you can uh, compute a matrix that's called a P, which sums up all powers of A. A plus A squared plus A to 3 and so on, until the whole thing saturates and nothing more happens, right? And if you then draw the graph you get from P, in the end from the matrix, this is exactly the accessibility graph, right? So this is a, um, a one way of computing that object. So um, this here is quite intuitive once you've got that with the matrix powers here. Um, and it's actually a well-known thing. So this is known since the 50s. This is nothing but a so-called Washel algorithm on networks. That's cool because we can be sure, okay, that's not wrong. It seems to work. Um, but I would like to stress the fact that there's actually more information, useful information, contained in the matrix P or in the, in, in the way of computing P. So it's not only to have that matrix in the end, what's very useful and helpful is to, to store the information on, on the way while, while you're computing the matrix P. Um, I would like to demonstrate that to you in a, in a computer experiment. Uh, here in the next slides, um, let's do the following. Let's, let's consider a random network. A random network means, let's say we have 1,000 nodes, we just place these 1,000 nodes somewhere in space, and then we place edges between them at random, right? Um, let's say 2,000 edges. Uh, then we have basically, in the end, we have something like a hairball network without any structure. It's just um, a random kind of structure, right? So what we do now is we compute the matrix P of that random hairball, um, and then we draw a diagram, uh, a figure, and this figure is on the x-axis, it contains the power we take into account in that formula here. You get the formula P is A plus A, to A squared plus A3 and so on, up to A to the power of N. On the x-axis, we, we plot this N, right? On the y-axis, we plot the number of non-zeros that the matrix P has. Let's call this the entry density of P, right? And if you do that for this hairball network, you get this nice picture here. Again, on the x-axis, there's the power of n. So the, the more you go right on the x-axis, the deeper you go into that formula. On the y-axis, you have the number of non-zeros here normalized to one of that matrix. And you get this nice S-shaped curve here. So that's interesting. That's pretty and cool. And so the question is, what is this? So what do we see here? What, what is this S-shaped thing? 
And so let's reconsider what we have did, what, what we did here. So on the x-axis, we compute something like a, then a plus a squared, and then a plus a squared plus a to the three, and so on. That basically means we are considering paths which are longer and longer and longer. So path of length one plus path of length two plus path of length three, and so on. So what, what this means is basically we, we're starting at each node of the network simultaneously, and then we are traversing network that's like a search algorithm. That happens on the x-axis, right? What we're doing with this procedure is actually finding shortest paths between nodes. We, we start everywhere at the same time and then spread over the network. On the y-axis, we count the number of, of these paths that we have found, normalized to one here, um, uh, in cumulative fashion, right? Because we're summing up things on the x-axis. So consequently, what you see here is nothing but the cumulative distribution function of shortest paths lengths in the network. And this is actually very cool, right? So that, that you have this uh, this kind of property here. So, and, and knowing that, you can of course now compute the derivative of that, and the derivative of that gives you a, also a, a well-known result. It's the probability distribution of shortest path length in a random network, right? Of, of this of this type here. In this case, this random network has a characteristic time scale uh, length scale, right? So we have here like a Gaussian kind of of curve with an average value of, let's say, 10, something like 10, right? So that means, on average, you would expect that you would take 10 steps to go here and they have all to there and they have, and they have all. So the characteristic path length here. Um, so this result itself is also, of course, well known from, from other methods, but the interesting thing here is the way how to get there. That's somehow different from, from, from classic or other methods uh, to compute that kind of result. And that's why I want to summarize that. Um, so the idea behind this here is um, we, you start with a network, then you step by step unfold the accessibility graph of the network explicitly step by step. And while you're doing that, you get information on shortest path lengths for free. Okay, so if you're interested in the methods here, this is your slide. This is the most central slides for understanding the, the underlying mechanisms here today. Okay, hope you, you, you get that message. So what we do now is we take that idea here and transfer that to temple networks because that should somehow also work for the temple case. That's called unfolding accessibility. Okay, temple networks, finally. So different slides color now, so that means that that's a different uh, topic now. So how can we compute the accessibility graph of temple networks? In static networks, we did something like that. So we had uh, this matrix P, right, and P was A plus A squared and so on. Um, so we use the powers of A to get that. Um, in temporal networks, mathematically speaking, we have, we go from a static adjacency matrix A to a sequence of these matrices, right? We have a flux of matrices, uh, A1, A2, A3, and so on. So that, that's what happens in temporal networks. So simply mathematically speaking, what we would have to do now is to replace powers by product, right? So A squared should go something like A1 times A2. So that's a very good approach in the first place, but it takes a little bit more than that, but this is a very good starting point. And so before we go, we go deeper here, so A squared we know already in the static network case gives us two step connections in the network. And in temporal networks, the question is, when do we get a contribution which is non-zero in this product A1 times A2? And we get a contribution here exactly when, let's say, a farmer buys pigs at day one and sells pigs at day two. Exactly when that happens, we get some non-zero entry here in that product. We said at the beginning that this is not a realistic picture because it's not like people are buying and selling um, animals every day. What happens is we have waiting times, and, and, and that is why we also have to take into account other combinations. For example, A1 times A3, right? Or also A1 times A100, or A1 times A1000 or so. So we have to, to uh, consider all these combinations because it can be that people have these long waiting times and they make a link in the network then, right? A two-step link. So that's how it goes. So that's, that's the, the very basic idea behind it. Um, if you put that together in math, I will not bore you with long formulas now, so you, um, I just focus on the, on the lower part here of the formula. Um, so if you, if you do some math, you end up with something really simple. Um, computing the accessibility matrix in temporal networks reduces to something very simple. So PT here is the accessibility graph of temporal network. 
And this, in the end, is something very small like this here. And what you see here is nothing but the product over all your snapshots. And you just have to add an identity matrix, which is a simple matrix containing of almost only zeros and some ones on the main diagonal. Um, you add that to each snapshot and you just multiply them, and that's all. It's actually a very simple formula in the end, and since it's so simple, it's also easy to implement it. Right? It's, it essentially can be done with one single loop of code. Then, of course, it requires some data cleaning and stuff like that, but in principle, it's a very simple formula. And that's actually quite cool. So, so right now, we have a, a tool that we can use to compute the accessibility graph of a temporal time-dependent network, which is even simple. Um, that's a cool thing. So let's apply that. Let's do that, right? So now we do the same, pretty much the same thing as we did before with this static hairball random network. Hope you remember that idea. And now let's apply that to our picture network. Okay, the real data set and the temporal resolution. Um, so what we do now, we try to reproduce the results that we have seen already. So what you see here is exactly the same that we saw a few pictures ago, a few slides ago, right? That was the static hairball thing. Just for you to remember, we computed this increasing or this S-shaped density over the power, and then derivative was the shortest path length, right? Now we do the same story for our data set and for temporal networks, so I'm using our new formula. And if we do that, we end up with this picture here. So here, the black line here corresponds to this thing here above, right? It's a cumulative one, and the blue line here is a derivative. Um, so let's just focus on the blue one. The black one is not important, not so important here. So first difference between these pictures is on the x-axis here, you see a different dimension. You see, you see the shortest path duration measured in days. It's, it, it does not give you the, the, the number of steps or so. It gives you the, the, the time it takes, right? It's, it's a time dimension. And so consequently, what you see here, that the blue curve is the shortest path duration distribution of the network. Right? You see that it's real-world data, so it's a little bit noisy and so that's okay, but in, in principle what you can see is you have a global maximum here. And that region here has a global maximum that means that the system possesses a mode or a typical scale, a typical time scale here in that sense, right? So in the, the maximum here is, is, I would say, is, let's say 120 days or so here. That is the maximum, and the maximum region is bounded here. It has a flank here uh, at about 180 days. That means, that's a very important statement, whatever spreads on that network, even though you don't know anything about it, if you, if you let something spread on the network, it will take more or less, rule of thumb, 120 days to infect or to, to reach larger, larger fractions of the network. And it's interesting to, to, to note that um, this is not a property of a specific disease or something like that. This is really a pure property of the network itself. Right, of the network data set. This is actually quite charming. So this here is the, let's say, the time scale of this pork producing clockwork, right? If you, if you, wanna, if you wanna put it that way. So that is, uh, I, I think, a very interesting, very interesting result. Of course, the question that arises from here is, where does this come from? So why, why do we have this particular time scale in this network? And in Germany, I can give you an answer for that because I know how the system works, um, the pig trade network. Um, as you know, Germans are always very precise and like machines and stuff like that, and that's why the production goes like that too. So the um, the um, the network actually is very organized and very industrialized. So there's not much backyards uh, farming and stuff like that. It's very highly industrialized, and it has very strict timescales as well. So in the in the uh, good model or a simplified model of this real huge network is. Um, to consider the pork production chains beneath it, right? Because actually the whole purpose of the whole thing is simply to produce pork meat. And the simple pork production chain looks more or less not exactly like this, right? You have here, you start at picnic producers, then you go over raising and fattening and then over slaughterhouses. And the good model of that whole network is to take many of these production chains and loosely connect them by, let's say, a little bit of randomness, right? Indicated here by these dashed arrows. Um, so, so this would give you a quite good uh, picture of the system. So, and the point is, in uh, even the lifetime, the life age of pigs is very determined here in Germany. Um, that is, a pig goes to a slaughterhouse when it's 180, uh, 180 days old. And so this is actually exactly like that, right? So there are, of course, a few exceptions, but uh, like 99.9% .9 of, of animals do like that. And, and that is why 180 days is the temporal diameter of one single production chain. 
right? So this is the largest time you can take for a path from a pickle producer to a slaughterhouse. And that is why you see that flank here in, in the picture, right? because that bounds the maximum region. So that bounds uh, the region where most of the things are happening, or where the core business, let's say, is happening. And so this is the longest path you can take from pickle producers to slaughter. But of course, there are many other paths, the paths too, like from raising to slaughter, for example, and these are shorter. And that is why, so there are many of these shorter paths, and that is why the maximum is a little bit shifted to the left in that diagram. So now we know how or we know why we have that time scale here in the system. That was one question at the beginning, right? One question was uh, how much time does a disease take to spread? Here we can use say that statistically we can say well around about 120 days. If you if you wish, you can look deeper into the into the accessibility matrix and give a very detailed answer for that, depending on your starting note. But here we have a very general statement. The second question, um, or actually the fourth question um, in the beginning slide was, um, can I approximate my network as being a static one? And this is something you can also answer using the accessibility matrices or the accessibility graphs. So it's actually quite simple to answer that question because you just have to um, uh, compare the number of, of paths that you find in your static accessibility matrix or in a temporal one. So you can simply, simply count how many connections, indirect connections, are there. So we know how to do that for a central network already, right? So we know how to compute an accessibility graph for that. Um, if you do that, you can so then you have this huge matrix P in the end, giving you the information, can I go from here to there, yes or no? And if you count all the non-zero values together, um, not normalized, you know how many paths there are. And the temple networks for our network here, we have one billion paths which are possible. So I can connect somehow one billion node pairs. And when I do that for the static network, I can connect more, right? So following the formulas at the beginning, um, I can connect 1.4 billion paths. What does that mean? If I would consider my network as being static or aggregated, that 28% of the paths in the aggregated network do actually not exist in the real system, right? So um, like we had in the beginning, so you have a static network and it mimics something like pipelines and so, but in fact, these things are not happening because edges disappear, they appear again and so, and that is why there's no causal path between some node pairs. And that's why 28% here in that case would be the error that you have um, uh, when you would treat the network as, as being static. You can also put it the other way around and reverse that and say, well, if I approximate my network as being static, I overestimate, for example, disease outbreaks by a factor of roughly 30%. That's pretty much the same statement. So more formally, we can put that into a simple equation, right, which is uh, called, I call this thing causal fidelity. Causal fidelity measures or quantifies the goodness of a um, static network approximation of a temporal network, right? So, and this is simply, uh, can simply be computed dividing the real temporal path density or the number of paths by the static path density, right? So that's exactly what we did on the last slide, on the previous slide. And for the picture network here, you get a value. That value is normalized between zero and one you have 72%, right? 100% means you can definitely consider or treat your temporal network as being static because everything is connected causally. Uh, something close to zero means, okay, don't do it. So don't treat this network as being, as being static at all. This value here, I would say, is somehow intermediate. I would here say it's hard to decide. Depends on the application. Um, so it can make sense to, to uh, consider this network as being static, but not in all. Uh, um, not for all purposes. So um, that, of course, very much depends on your data set. Okay, so that's um, causal fidelity, right? So that was the, the other question in the beginning. So let's uh, do a little recap here um, uh, about the first half of the talk, or not half, um, three, three quarters maybe. Um, so we talked about networks here, of course, today. Um, our perspective on the network is the accessibility of the network, the path structure. And the reason is simply this concept holds for static networks and also for temporal networks. What we have seen so far is that using the unfolding of the accessibility matrix is very useful to get path length distributions in static networks and path duration distributions in temporal networks, following very much the same idea. The only thing that you need for that is that formula here for temporal network accessibility. 
Once you have that, you can also put the two worlds together again and make it comparable and compute cost fidelity. And then you know whether it makes sense to treat the network as, as static or uh, if, you, if you really have to do all that um, mathematical complicated thing. Okay, so much about the concepts. I hope you understood how, how, these, how these simple concepts work, or the, the basic concepts. So um, if you're interested in using that, there's also software for that online. I know that Alfredo and other colleagues maybe use it uh, already anyway. I'll just give you a very small introduction on how that works. Uh, the software is written in Python. You will find it on GitHub if you wish, and it's, uh, it's quite easy to use once you, once you got it. Um, all you need for that is an, is an input file uh, that's called edges.txt here as an example. It contains three columns. Um, first column is the source node column, then comes the, the target node column and the time column. And here in this example, the first line means from source code number zero to target node number uh, number one. At time zero, there's a link. Right? And then you have like millions of these lines. That's how such an input file looks like. Uh, edges.txt. And if you want to analyze it, you just simply go into Python and, and import the, uh, um, the class provided by the code here. I call it the adjacency matrix sequence. Makes sense, of course. Um, then you read the text file. It's just one line of code. You just say, okay, give me an adjacency matrix sequence out of the edges.txt input file. Here, if you wish uh, a directed network, of, of course, you can also set that to false and the network is undirected. And um, then all you have to do to, in order to compute the accessibility of the network, um, you just say uh, C equals um, AT unfold accessibility. So that's all. And you have to wait for seconds, minutes, hours, days, depending on your network size. And uh, what this gives you then, C is this curve that you see here, right? That is the cumulative, the cumulative curve that we saw before. And if you wanted to have the derivative of that, you can use a more built-in Python function, NumPy gradient of C, and that gives you the, uh, the blue one that we saw before. So this is a very little overview of how the software works. OK, so much about accessibility graphs. Some of you might wonder, uh, why is he talking about accessibility all the time? Uh, what's, what about epidemics? Um, so maybe you have realized during your talk already, if not, um, it's actually very straightforward to go from paths to epidemic models, because epidemic models are actually very much the same as paths. Um, and that is why I would like to dive a little bit more into epidemic models here, um, just the last little part of this talk here. So, so far, what we have been doing is we had a look at pictures like that, right? That was the one from the hairball thing. So it's basically, uh, okay, at the x-axis, there is a number of steps or so, or time, no matter what. Uh, on the, the y-axis, there is a path density, right? So, a number of paths. So, it's straightforward to say, okay, if actually we can say that this density here, we consider as the density of infectious paths. Let's say the infection probability from that node infecting that node, you pawn an edge, is one, then it's exactly the same, right? So, then this is actually nothing but um, an infectious path in the network. So if this is the case, then what you see here is nothing but a so-called SI infection curve. That means um, S stands for susceptible and I for infected. Uh, that means that nodes can either be in the, in the susceptible state or an infected state. Once they are infected, they stay infected forever, right? And so this, this is actually very straightforward to see that. And if you say, well, the, the, the um, infection probability is less than one, you could, for example, simply remove edges at random and you would have very much the same picture, right? So that's very straightforward. So technically speaking, um, what we did so far here is a special SI type process, susceptible infected, with infinite infectious period, right? Tau, let's call it tau, and that's equal to uh, infinity here. So that is the most, uh, the simplest infection model that you can that you can do. Of course, we're interested in to do a more complex one. Let's do another one. Let's ask ourselves the question. So what, what happens if the infectious period is finite, right? So um, if I'm not infected forever, like common cold or so, I have the, I have the common cold for, for a week and it's gone. And then I cannot get it anymore, right? So and this is then called an SIR type of process. It has a little different dynamics. So R stands for recovered. So whenever you are infectious for, for a certain time, after this time you become recovered and you're basically not taking place anymore in the infection process. Question is, how can we do that? So how can we transfer our 
a mathematical model here on temple networks to SIR type of processes. So that's, I would, uh, that's something I would like to sketch in the, in the last few slides. Um, before we do that, I would, I would briefly summarize uh, one, two um, important findings of SI and SIR models from classical mathematical epidemiology. So in, in classical models, classical means differential equation models without networks, where you say, well, infection happens like in chemistry, so you mix up things and they just react somehow without knowing their contact structure. An SI model, as you see on the left side here, um, has a certain solution, so it looks like this, right? So if, you, if you do that, mathematically, if you write down such a model, it can be described using two differential equations. I will not go into detail here, considering the equations, that's not so, not so interesting at the moment. Point is, what you can do with these equations, you can explicitly write down, write down the, the incidence, that is the new infections per time step, and you can explicitly solve that, right? You, can, you don't even have to, to use a computer for this simple model. You can write down a closed solution for it. It's not important how the, how the solution looks like, it's important that it's there, right? You can, you can look it up somewhere. Um, so in some sense, we also, for our SI model so far, we also have some kind of closed solution. For our temple network so far, we have the, the path density here over time, uh, or the, the, um, the, the, the density of, of the uh, accessibility matrix, let's say. And so when you come from statistical physics or so, you would say, well, this is very much the same as the, as the mean outbreak size over time, right? provided that the infection parameter is one. So th this is not, not so important in detail. Important here that there's a closed solution for it, right? This, this simple equation is a closed kind of mathematical solution for that kind of problem. Um, if you look at the SAR model on the right-hand side, it's a little bit different. It has three components, susceptible, infected, recovered. It has to be described by three equations. And um, here, in, here again, these three equations, they are easy to solve on the computer. They are not solvable by hand. There's no closed solutions for that. What you still can do is write down the incidence. You can write down how many uh, new infected you have over time and so. That's an important theoretical step but there's no explicit solution, right? And that is also why we cannot expect to have an explicit solution for our temporal network SIR model, right? So we will probably end up with something a little bit algorithmic or iterative or something like that. So we, can, we cannot expect to have something super elegant. I would just like to, um, to sketch um, how the idea is, how you, how you go from our um, SI model to an SIR model. Um, the name of that is called an incidence formulation. Um, but that's just the name. So I just briefly show you how that works. Um, I, that these are hopefully almost the last formulas here in this talk. Um, starting point is our SI model, right? Our SI model was, is nothing like the accessibility graph formula. Um, that's our starting point. First thing that we do is we rewrite that model so that we can use incidents explicitly. This, this is a very useful trick. That basically means we, we write two equations, one of them is recursive, um, so that this is the incidence matrix here over time. So it basically tells us which new link, so this is basically the, the wave front of the infection, right? So this is contained in the, in the incidence matrix. That is recursive because it, it, it uh, depends on, on the incidence that has been uh, in the last time step. And if you sum all the incidences together, you end up with your accessibility matrix. So step number two here is mathematically equivalent to number one. It's just a different way of writing it. And the reason is that um, if you write it in that way, you can play around with your indices here. And uh, this is the way to introduce a finite memory here. So a finite memory can be introduced if you take the incident matrix um, and manipulate it a, a tiny bit. That means that you, that you only consider um, incidences, let's say the last seven days or so. So they play a role. Everything that happened before this last seven days doesn't play any role anymore. That's, that's the idea here, right? So and if, you, if you do it in that way, you have an SIR model on the network almost. The last step you will have to take is you have to subtract recovered uh, paths already. So once you have been infected as a path or as a, as a connection, after a while you disappear anyway, right? So, um, so these are, in a nutshell, all steps you have to take to go from an SI model to an SIR model in temporal networks. This work has been done by a, a student of mine, Andreas Kohr, um, a few years ago. Um, right, one equation in that paper here is what I just said, is that you have the new infectious path, so the incidence, the wave front, let's say, 
is given by the contacts that you had within the infectious period. So nodes are infected, have new contacts, and disease spreads upon these, these contacts. And finally, you have to subtract the paths that were infectious before. Right? In a nutshell, that's how it works. Equations itself is not so important. The main idea is the, the main point is that you understand the idea. So uh, let's say that works, right? Some clever student like Andreas has implemented that, and then we can work, we can work with it. So let's apply that one. Uh, let's 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 take our pig trade network and do an SIR model on the pig trade network. So um, the results that we get there are very analogous to the results we had before, like the uh, accessibility matrix results and so. Um, first, we can compute the number of infectious paths over time, right? So um, here you see. Uh, on the x-axis time, on the y-axis the path density, but here only the path density of infectious paths, right? The path uh, where the fire is burning, right? So that the number of, of uh, new connections which are active at the moment, which infect others. So and this, of course, depends on the infectious period, right? The infectious period is tau here. Let's start with a dashed one, with the gray dashed one. That's an infinite infectious period. Um, that is our SI model, right? So this is the exactly the same thing as, as we had before. And now if we make the infectious period smaller, like uh, um, uh, two weeks, four weeks, uh, six weeks or so, um, then you see that you have like a typical SIR curve that you have um, an increase in your number of infected, let's say, and then they decrease and then finally infection goes to zero, right? So that, that's what you get here, like a classical kind of SIR thing. The very similar thing you can do with the recovered paths. Here now you have three types of paths. You have susceptible paths, infected paths, and recovered paths. You have three matrices. Um, and here you see something very similar to a classic model. Um, for an infinite infectious period, you have again the, the dashed gray line, which here coincides with this one, so that they're actually the same. And if you make the um, infectious period smaller, you get less recovered in the end. So and maybe the most important picture here is the last one I will show you in a minute. Um, that is, depending on your infectious period, how large will your outbreaks be? So, and this is how it looks like. Let's just focus on the blue line for, for a minute and just forget about the, the gray stuff for a second. Um, so here on the x-axis, you see the infectious period measured in days, right? And on the y-axis, the final outbreak size. The final outbreak size is the same as looking at the final state of recovery here. Huh? And as you, so this is something you would, of course, expect, right? So you would say, well, yeah, the, the larger the infectious period is, the larger is the outbreak. Totally makes sense. Um, that is clear. Somehow, what's interesting about this plot is something else. And uh, in physics, you would say this is a second order phase transition, kind of. Um, and this is, um, this is that you have a very small infectious period. You don't have, have outbreaks at all, or they are super small, so nothing happens. And then there is one kind of lift-off point. So when the infectious period reaches a certain value, then the outbreak size starts to increase, right? In order to highlight that point, that starting point is um, uh, I, I computed the derivative here. So the, the the gray, a little bit noisy looking thing here is the derivative of the um, of the blue one here. And this here is the point. So this is uh, even zoomed in a little bit. Um, so, so this here is the point where you have the largest derivative. So that means there's the largest change in the blue curve. And uh, this is very useful um, to, to use that point, this maximum derivative, so this um, steepest increase, let's say, of the, of the outbreak size, to define a critical value. Right? And the critical value here, let's call it critical infectious period, is 20 days in that case, roughly. That means if, if you are disease uh, and you have an infectious period which is less than 20 days, you cannot infect larger fractions of the system, of the network, simply because the, the pace of the edges activating and de deactivating and so is against you and it's just, it just doesn't happen, right? It dies out before it can reach larger fractions. Whenever an um, infectious period is longer than 20 days, it is capable of infecting larger fractions um, of the system. Right? And this here, again, is not a property of a specific disease. This is a, this critical point, the critical infectious period here, is the property of the network itself. Right? It's a property of the data set. So that's actually quite interesting. Of course, now you can comp compare that to values that you know from literature, for example. 
So as, as an example, classical swine fever, I read somewhere, has an, an roundabout uh, infectious period of 28 days. If that is the case, it is capable of infecting larger fractions of the system. That's the critical infectious period. Um, with this, I would like to, to summarize the talk. So on one slide, I hope that works. Um, so today we talked about networks, as you all know. Our perspective on networks, accessibility, because it works for static and temporal, both. In the first part, we have seen that unfolding the accessibility graph gives us uh, um, information about shortest path lengths in, in, in networks, shortest path durations in, in temporal networks. And we have also seen that this is pretty much the same as SI as I kind of processes, right? So this is actually all you need in order to compute SI models on, on networks, um, on, on temporal networks. If you want to go a little bit more complicated, if you want to include a, a third compartment, like SIR models or so, you have to switch your formulation a bit, right? You have to, to move away from classic accessibility. You have to use an in incidence formulation. That means you have to consider explicitly the kind of wave front in the network. When you do that, you have SIR dynamics, right? You have dynamics with a finite memory that go up and down again. And then most importantly, from my point of view, the critical infectious period, right? This is another property of the system. So now you can say, okay, what class of diseases is a threat at all and which other class of diseases is uh, harmless for, for the whole network. So uh, if you're interested in that, here are some papers on that. I guess there are more at the moment, uh, but these are the basic ones, I would say. So if you're more from a theoretical background, the, the first two ones are very readable for you. And uh, the last one, the, the PLOS one, 2016 here, is more tutorial-like. So that's also, it's actually written for veterinarians and so on, so it's very applied. And I hope that helps you a bit. If you're, interested, if you're interested in working with that, you find here that's a link to the Python code that you can absolutely feel free to use. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lecture. You're so welcome. And so I think we are going to go. Okay. Thank you all very much for having me and hope to see you one day in live.